Her parents were not going to let time continue to pass without any answers, so they drove around that night trying to see if they could find Rachel, but they couldn't. There was absolutely no sign of Rachel anywhere, and she didn't return home that night. Her family just knew that this was so serious and that something horrible must have happened to Rachel. Hey everyone, welcome back to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I hope you guys are doing super, super well. Welcome to episode 21. Today we're gonna to be talking about what happened to 15 year old Rachel Barber. Someone sent this to me on Instagram and when I started looking into it, I was just so shocked. What happened to Rachel is so disturbing because her life was taken by someone that she trusted. And the reason that her life was taken was because of envy. It's a really upsetting case and it's even more upsetting to see how the police handled the case from the start. There is just so much information to go over, so let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Rachel Barber. Rachel Barber was born on September 12, 1983 in Victoria, Australia to her parents Elizabeth and Michael Barber. She was the eldest in the family and she had two younger sisters named Ashley and Harbour. So let's talk a little bit about the Barber family. They were a loving and kind family that supported each other through anything. Watching interviews with Elizabeth and with Rachel's sisters, I mean, you can just get the feeling that they love each other so much and that they were genuinely a happy family. Elizabeth and Michael had a very loving relationship relationship and Rachel and her two younger sisters were extremely close. Everyone in the household was always very creative and musical. All three of the daughters were always encouraged to pursue their creative interests and to follow their dreams. From a young age, Rachel was really interested in the arts and in the theater. She would direct these plays for Heather and for Ashley to perform in, and it was just something that they loved doing as sisters. She would set up these plays for them and then they would perform it in front of the family. And, you know, I'm sure so many of you guys experienced the same thing with like your cousins or with your sisters and it was just a really good memory that they had together. Rachel loved to perform so much that she eventually took an interest in dance with a special interest in ballet. Elizabeth says that ballet was practically Rachel's entire life. She would come home from school and then she would turn the living room into a dance studio and just practice all afternoon. The family had accepted that their house was always going to be looking a little bit crazy because Rachel wanted to use the space you know to be creative and you know she would come home she would put on her dresses and then she would do an improvised dance and then perform it in front of her family. And her parents just loved that about her. They loved that she was so passionate about this and they wanted to support her interest in dancing. So they actually signed her up for ballet lessons. When Rachel started taking these classes, she just fell in love with dancing even more. And it was something that, you know, she really looked forward to. She just could not get enough of dancing that even during her lunch breaks at school, she would practice. It truly was Rachel's dream to one day become a professional dancer and then eventually open up her own dance studio. When Rachel was around nine years old, her family moved to Mount Albert, which is a suburb of Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Now, this town seemed like a good place to raise a family and it just seemed very quiet and safe. As soon as the Barbers moved into their new neighborhood, you know, they were already making friends with their neighbors and with people in the community. As for Rachel, she continued having her passion for dancing. Now, along with being an excellent dancer, Rachel was also a bright student and all of her friends described her as being very popular, friendly, and just absolutely beautiful. Rachel had these, you know, beautiful emerald green eyes and everyone says that she just looked like a model. Since everyone was always telling her, you know, how pretty she was, Rachel did start to get the idea that maybe she could go into modeling someday. Now, even though Rachel was pretty popular in school, she was still shy and she was even more afraid of strangers. She really wasn't the type of person that would start up a conversation with just anyone out in public. And her mother Elizabeth says that Rachel wouldn't trust just anybody. She wouldn't walk off with someone she doesn't know. She wouldn't interact with a complete stranger. She would only be around people that she genuinely trusted. So the family moves to this new town and Rachel continues going to her dance lessons. However, over time, Rachel started to have less interest in her schoolwork because she just started to have more interest in dancing. Even though school was something that she was really good at and of course it was important, she just couldn't ignore the fact that she had a passion for dancing and that that's just what she wanted to prioritize in life. So in 1998, when Rachel was in high school, Rachel's dad, Michael, enrolled her at the dance factory. 
which was one of the most prestigious schools in Melbourne. So when Rachel was in this school, she still had to attend like regular classes. The only difference is that this was like an art school. So, you know, instead of taking like gym class, you would take dance classes and it was more like focused on, you know, being creative. Now, while Rachel attended the dance factory, she met a boy named Emmanuel Carella, who went by Manny. Now, he attended classes with Rachel and the two of them quickly became friends and then they eventually started dating. Everyone loved their relationship. You know, they were both good looking people and their friends jokingly called them Romeo and Juliet. Elizabeth says that Rachel's life was going amazing. You know, she was basically on top of the world and she had so many hopes and dreams and just so much ambition. But unfortunately, on March 1st, 1999, everything would change for the Barber family. That day, 15-year-old Rachel went to school just like any other normal day. When she left her house, she was wearing black pants and a blue top, a gold necklace with a diamond-like stone, and then a blue topaz ring. And then she was also carrying her backpack, which had a sewn-on purple heart, and inside her backpack, she had her wallet, which had $13 inside. That morning, her father, Michael, dropped her off at the streetcar station on his way to work at around 9.30 in the morning. From there, Rachel took a streetcar to another spot to meet up with her friends at around 10.15, and then from there, they all walked to school together. Now, Rachel's friends noticed that she just seemed a little bit more excited that day. She looked happier, and they asked her, you know, what's going on? And that's when Rachel told her friends that she was about to make a lot of money that night, but that she couldn't tell them how she was going to be making it. The friends tried to press her on this, but Rachel just wouldn't budge. Eventually, Rachel and Manny went off school property together to go have some lunch. And while they were walking around, she showed him this pair of shoes out of a store that she planned on buying tomorrow when she had the money that she was going to be making that night. Manny asked her, you know, how are you going to get this money? And Rachel just simply said that she was meeting up with an old girlfriend and that she was going to make a bunch of money and also get free clothes while doing this. And that she couldn't say much about what she was going to do because she wasn't allowed to tell anyone about what was happening. It all just seemed very secretive and and Manny was concerned about this. He didn't know if Rachel was doing something dangerous or what was really going on, but Rachel assured him that the job was moral and that it came from a trusted friend. So he had nothing to worry about. After lunch, they went back to school. They went to all of their classes. And then the school day ended at 5.30 p.m. Rachel's boyfriend, Manny, and some of her friends walked with Rachel back to the streetcar station so that Rachel could take the train back. And then, as I mentioned, her dad would pick her up from the station and then take her home. However, before they got to the station, Manny actually left because he was going in a different direction. So they all said goodbye to Manny. And then after that, Rachel actually didn't go to the station with her friends, you know, the regular station that she would always go to. She told her friends that this time she was going to be taking a different route that night. And then she walked towards a streetcar stop that was in the opposite direction, about a 22 minute walk from school. Now, Rachel's plan was to still be picked up by her dad at her normal stop later at 6.15 p.m. So she was gonna get off and then walk back to her normal stop so that her dad could pick her up as planned. I'm not sure how that would have worked out with the timing, but that's what she told her friends. The friends told her, okay, sounds good. And then they all parted ways and Rachel walked off all by herself to this other stop. Later that night, Michael arrived at the station on time at around 6.15 p.m. to pick up his daughter, Rachel, but she wasn't there. Michael started driving around town looking for any signs of her, but he found none. Now, this was really odd because Rachel was always on time. And if she wasn't going to be on time, then she would have told her parents about where she was going to be and why she was going to be late. Now, meanwhile, Elizabeth was back back at home with Rachel's younger sisters, you know, getting everything ready for dinner. And she started to get worried because Rachel and Michael were still not home yet. At around 7.40 p.m., Michael called the house and he told Elizabeth that he was 10 miles away in Blackburn at his parents' house. And he told her that Rachel just never showed up at the streetcar stop. And he was wondering if Elizabeth had heard anything from her or if, he had, or if she had seen Rachel. Elizabeth said no, that she had not seen Rachel and both parents were just so concerned. Now, there was a second stop that Rachel would go to two times a week. So Michael went to go check that stop, you know, just in case, but Rachel wasn't there. Elizabeth immediately called the police and told them about Rachel's disappearance, but 
the police weren't too helpful. They told the family that they had to wait a little bit more because, you know, maybe Rachel was just being a moody 15-year-old girl. You know, she wanted a break from the family and that she would eventually return home. So they basically just said that this was a runaway situation and that, you know, teenagers sometimes disappear and that they're normally just with their friends or with their boyfriend. And, you know, they assured the parents that Rachel would be back, which is frustrating. I cannot believe that they told the family this. It's really frustrating when police think that it's a runaway situation situation when it's clearly not. You know, Elizabeth and the rest of the family said that there was no way Rachel would run away and put her family through this type of stress. They weren't even fighting and there really was no drama happening in the household, so there was no reason for Rachel to want to leave. The police were not too helpful, so the parents started calling around to the friends and to her boyfriend to see if they could get more information about what happened to Rachel. And that's when Manny told them about what Rachel had said that day, about how she was going to be making money and getting free clothes. Close. Now, when the parents heard this, they were so confused because this was the first time that they were hearing about this job. So they kept calling around to Rachel's friends, and that's when they found out that Rachel had gone to a different streetcar stop than her normal one. All of this behavior just seemed so odd, so Michael went to the police station to tell them about this new update, you know, about Rachel saying that she had this weird job to do and about going to a different stop, and, you know, he tried to officially report her as missing. Her parents were not going to let time continue to pass without any answers, so they drove around that night trying to see if they could find Rachel, but they couldn't. There was absolutely no sign of Rachel anywhere, and she didn't return home that night. Her family just knew that this was so serious and that something horrible must have happened to Rachel. The next morning, on March 2nd, Rachel's family was ready to keep the investigation going. They brought in pictures to include in the missing persons report to the police station, but then that's when they were told that nothing had ever been filed and that there was no missing persons report. Again, the police were convinced that she was a runaway and that she would eventually show up. So that meant that the police did nothing to look for Elizabeth last night when her parents first told them about her disappearance, which is just so incredibly frustrating because the first 24 to 48 hours are so important and police were just refusing to do anything. The family just felt so helpless and alone, but they knew that they had to do something and that they couldn't just wait around, so they started their own investigation. They went over to the dance factory and they asked her friends and teachers for any information. The school let them look in her locker, but all that was inside was her wallet. After that, the parents went to the shoe store where Rachel had told Manny that she was going to buy these shoes with the money that she received from the job. So they went to the store and they talked to the person who worked there. This employee confirmed that yes, they had put these shoes on hold for Rachel because she told them that she would be buying them today but that Rachel hadn't shown up yet to purchase them. Her family continued to ask around about Rachel, you know, just asking people working and walking around if they had seen her. One person told them that a man was recently released from jail who was running a brothel in an area called Fitzroy, which was about a 10-minute drive from Rachel's school, and that the reason he was in jail was for exploiting younger girls into sex work. So after hearing that, her parents called the brothel to see if Rachel was there but the brothel said that there was no underage girls there and that it was a completely legal business, so they were checking IDs and everything was completely legal. Brothels are legal in some countries, so there wasn't like some under the table type of business going on. So after that, Rachel's parents tried calling hospitals to see if, you know, Rachel was there and the hospitals told them that due to hospital privacy rules, they actually couldn't tell them if Rachel was there or not, which is crazy because if you're, you know, trying to call to figure out if your daughter or your son got in a car accident and they're just not going to tell you that's just crazy. Now, at this point, police still aren't helping them, even though the school has now also contacted them because Rachel didn't show up to school. It wasn't until three days after Rachel went missing that the police officially launched a formal investigation into the disappearance of Rachel Barber. Three days, that's absolutely insane. And then they told the parents that they were gonna go down to the school right away to investigate, but they literally didn't. They didn't go to the school and it just seemed like they still weren't doing anything. So the last thing that the parents knew about Rachel is that she was going to be meeting up with an old friend. But with who? That was the main question, you know, who was this old friend? The parents started making a list of all of Rachel's friends, you know, literally every single girlfriend that she ever had in the past, just to see if they could narrow down who this person could be. They also got together more photos, hoping that this would like, you know, make the police humanize Rachel a little bit more. And they brought all of this down to the police station. And on March 4th, police started to interview Rachel's friends. Now, the first to be interviewed was Manny. You know, I feel like in most situations, police always look at the partner first 
first. So since Manny was the boyfriend in the situation, of course, police were suspicious of him. Now, the police had this theory that maybe Rachel was pregnant and that she had run away from home because she was worried about what her parents would say about the pregnancy or maybe she thought that Manny was mad at her and that's why she left home. Now, Manny listened to this theory and he said that there was just no way that Rachel was pregnant and he was fully cooperating with the police and, you know, he also told them about Rachel's mystery job. You know, he was just really open with them and he seemed absolutely distraught about Rachel's disappearance. Rachel's other friends also corroborated, you know, Manny's story and told the police that, you know, she had talked about this mystery job with them as well. You know, it wasn't just something that like Manny had made up and was like, oh yeah, she said she was gonna go do a job later, you know, or anything like that. So the police listened to all of this and they eventually clear Manny because he did have a solid alibi that night and they go over to Rachel's house and they search her room to find any clues. That's when they end up finding a note that said, quote, station, go to Manny, 50 to $80, three special things. Police look at this note and they ask the family, what does this mean? Rachel's parents said that this note was written by Rachel four months ago and that it was about a gift that she was getting for Manny. But the police said no, that this was proof that she had run away. So the police told Rachel's parents that they shouldn't focus on finding Rachel because she had run away and that instead they should focus on the daughters that were there. Can you imagine? It's also the extreme gaslighting that is just so insane to me. It's just really disappointing how investigators handled this and I just can't imagine telling a family that. And they were basically telling the family, you know, forget about Rachel and just focus on your two other daughters that are actually there. Everyone was literally telling the detectives that Rachel would never run away and that this weird mystery job probably had something to do with her disappearance, but police just didn't want to hear it. On March 6th, her parents remembered that there was a guy who was an acquaintance of the family who had always been kind of creepy and they had even caught him looking in the windows before, so they thought that they should bring that information to the police. And when they did, the police said that they had already used up enough of their time and resources on this. Elizabeth just completely broke down. You know, she just felt so helpless. Imagine trying to find out what happened to your daughter and then the police telling you that you're wasting their time. There just really wasn't much movement in Rachel's investigation. That was until March 11th. That's when a girl named Allison Guberek, who was an older sister of one of Rachel's younger sister's friends, had seen a poster of Rachel that her parents had put up. Now, at this point, Allison didn't know that Rachel was missing, but when she saw this flyer, she went into the police station because she actually had seen Rachel the day she went missing, which is crazy that the only reason she saw that is because of the flyers that Rachel's parents had put up, not that the police had put up, and this was 11 days later, so if police had already put Rachel's face all over the news and all over town, you know, maybe Allison would have known about her disappearance sooner and brought this information to the police sooner. So she told the police that she had seen Rachel at 6.40 p.m. at tram stop number six and that Rachel wasn't alone. Rachel was taking this train with another girl who Allison did not know, and she says that the girl looked older than them. So Rachel, this unknown girl, and Allison all got on the train, and Allison could hear Rachel talking to the unknown girl about money and about how they were going to do something that night. Now, from what I understand, all three of them weren't like hanging out together and talking on the train. It was more like Allison also got on the train, she saw Rachel, and then she overheard this conversation. Allison saw that Rachel and this unknown girl got off at the High Street and William Road station. After that, Allison saw them stand outside of a car dealership and talk. Now, Allison said that this unknown friend had blonde hair and that she was simple looking. She specifically said, quote, I remember Rachel looked quite beautiful and that she was striking in contrast with this other girl who was plain looking. Now, this was a huge lead in the investigation. I mean, finally, there was a description of who this unknown person was. The police had Allison do a composite sketch of this girl and Allison assisted the police in creating a computer generated image of the girl. So the barbers were first shown this sketch and at the time they said that they didn't know who the girl in this sketch was. Okay, so while all of this is going on, Elizabeth has been doing her own digging, trying to figure out who Rachel could have been meeting. So she had contacted her phone service provider to get their home phone records to see if there were any numbers calling the house that she didn't know. And when she got those records, sure enough, she found that a 
an unknown number had called the house phone twice on February 28th, just one day before Rachel's disappearance. The first call was at 5.25 p.m. and it lasted 15 minutes, and then the second call was at 5.45 p.m. and it lasted for 29 minutes. Now, no one in the family had ever received a call from that number, let alone for a long time, so they assumed it must have been Rachel who had answered those phone calls. And in fact, Elizabeth had remembered Rachel being on the phone that night on February 28th, but at the time, she thought that she was just talking to her boyfriend, Manny. The parents kept looking at the phone number trying to figure out who this belonged to and the police were able to trace it back and it turned out that the family did know who this person was. The number belonged to 19 year old Caroline Reed Robertson. Now Caroline used to live in the barber's old neighborhood and she was a friend of the family who had actually been a babysitter to Rachel and her two younger sisters countless times. So she was kind of like a family friend and what's shocking is that Caroline had actually called the barbers a few days after Rachel disappeared on March 7th at around 9.15 in the morning. She called the barbers and she told them that she had seen the news about Rachel's disappearance and that she wanted to check in on them and to see how they were doing and if there was anything that she could do to help out. Now at first the barbers didn't think much about her phone call. I mean they hadn't really spoken to Caroline since they had moved away but they thought it was nice that she was you know calling in to check in. So let's talk a little bit about who Caroline is. Caroline's younger sister had actually been friends with one of the younger barber sisters and that's how she got the babysitting job. She lived across the street from the barber household and she was five years older than Rachel. When Elizabeth first met Caroline, you know, she thought that she was just like a regular girl, you know, like nothing really stood out about her, but she did notice that Caroline was very reserved and that she had a very quiet personality. Now the families were somewhat similar you know Caroline lived across the street with her two parents and her two sisters and then Rachel lived across the street with her two sisters and her two parents so they were similar in that sense but their family dynamics were completely different the barber household was happy they were loving and they just had such a close and supportive relationship with each other Elizabeth and Michael had such a great marriage and Rachel and her sisters got along so well across the street at Caroline's house, things were not like that at all. Her parents were in the process of getting a divorce and her dad eventually left the house and went on to marry someone else. The divorce caused so many issues between Caroline and her mother and between her sisters. So they were all basically constantly fighting and it was just a very unhappy home. So Caroline would leave her, you know, toxic household and then she would go across the street to babysit the barber girls. And, you know, that's when she would enter this happy and loving environment that she wished she had. In 1997, she had actually taken photos of Rachel for a school project. And Elizabeth remembered that Caroline had told Rachel in 1998 that she could get Rachel paid modeling jobs. So that's a little bit about the history between, you know, Caroline and the Barbers. Going back to the investigation, the family realizes that the girl in the composite sketch must be Caroline. I mean, what are the odds that she had spoken on the phone with Rachel twice before her disappearance and in the past she had offered Rachel some jobs. So it just seemed like Caroline was this mystery friend. And, you know, when the family realized that Rachel was probably with Caroline, they felt a little bit better about this. Elizabeth says she thought to herself, oh, okay, good. Like my daughter isn't out there getting, you know, raped. She's not getting assaulted. She's with a family friend. They just felt better about the situation. Now the police immediately started looking into Caroline and it turns out that her apartment was right by the tram stop where Rachel had been seen with the older friend. The police tried to contact her, but Caroline was impossible to get a hold of. They tried calling her and, you know, knocking on the door, but they heard nothing. And at this point they didn't have a warrant. So the police went into Caroline's work where she was a sales coordinator at a telecommunications company. They found out that Caroline was out sick and she had been out sick pretty much every day since the day that Rachel went missing on March 1st. Police talked to her co-workers and they discovered that Caroline being out of work wasn't really like a normal thing for her. They also learned that she had called one of her colleagues repeatedly asking them to return the $320 that she had lent her. Now she said that she needed this money because she was actually moving furniture from her apartment to her dad's property and she had the movers booked for the next day so she needed that money to pay them. Her co-worker said that on March 4th Caroline had shown up to work that day and that she was constantly talking about Rachel's disappearance and how Rachel had a history of running away which again is absolutely not true. So after speaking to her coworkers, police go back to Caroline's neighborhood and they start speaking to some of her neighbors. 
One neighbor said that they heard loud crying coming from Caroline's apartment in the early morning hours of March 2nd. It was so loud that it actually woke this neighbor up. They said it sounded like, quote, a furious tantrum. But at the time, they didn't think that it could possibly be something serious. You know, these didn't sound like cries for help, so the neighbor just didn't do anything about what they heard. After this, detectives go and they speak to Caroline's father to see if maybe he knew something about where his daughter was or about, you know, what her behavior had been for the past few days. The father said that he had actually stopped by his daughter's apartment because he heard that she was sick. And, you know, one thing he did notice was that she refused to let him inside her bedroom. She kept the bedroom door closed closed and locked. He was a little bit weirded out by this, but he didn't really think much of it at the time. Police then discovered that on one of her sick days, March 10th, she had applied for a $10,000 car loan. But Caroline didn't drive. She didn't even have her license. And, you know, no one had mentioned her trying to buy a car. So this did seem a little bit odd. And it turns out that the loan was declined. Now, she had told her co-workers that she needed the money back because she was going to be moving some furniture. So detectives looked into this and they confirmed that, yes, movers were booked and they did come to her apartment on March 3rd. And one of the furniture pieces that she was having moved was a statue. Now, the statue was wrapped up in a carpet and in blankets, and it was inside of a duffel bag. The movers then took the duffel bag to Caroline's dad's farm in Kilmore, which is an hour and 15 minute drive away. Very suspicious behavior. Also, I do just want to point out that some sources say that she ordered a taxi. Others say a removal list or furniture movers, but... Either way, she ordered someone to come and help her because she didn't drive. So on March 12th at 9 a.m., police went to Caroline's apartment to speak to her again, but she didn't answer the door. So they came back at 5.30 p.m., but this time when Caroline didn't answer, they just went in. I'm not sure if they had a warrant at this point or if they heard something inside, but either way, they entered. And when they did, they found Caroline unconscious in her bedroom next to an empty bottle of Tegridol, which was an epilepsy medication. Although she appeared to be dead, you know, it kind of appeared to be like she took her own life situation. It turns out that she was just unresponsive because Caroline did have a pulse. So they immediately rushed her to the hospital. Another thing that was weird about Caroline is that her hair had these like green streaks in it. So it looked like she had been trying to dye her hair. While she was being transported to the nearest hospital, the investigation team stayed behind so that they could thoroughly search the apartment. And it looked like she had been packing to go somewhere and the place was really messy. They found several clothes that were not Caroline's size, but that they would have been Rachel's size. They also found an application for a birth certificate in the name of Rachel Elizabeth Barber which what like why does she have rachel's birth certificate they also found several notebooks which we will get into a little bit later so caroline came to at the hospital and it turns out she had an epileptic fit but that she was going to be just fine so the police questioned caroline at the hospital you know about rachel and she actually just confessed to everything police superintendent neil patterson was the one interrogating caroline and he asked her where is Rachel? And Caroline calmly replied with, she's dead. Neil was surprised by this answer and he said, you sure she's dead? She said, yes, I've buried her. Police were just so shocked by her confession and about how calm she seemed. So this is what happened the night of Rachel's death. Caroline had invited Rachel to come over to her apartment saying that she could participate in a psychological survey and that it would pay $100. She had insisted to Rachel that the survey was extremely, extremely confidential and that she could not share any information about it with family or friends. After meeting up at the tram station, the girls headed over to Caroline's apartment where they ate some pizza that Caroline had actually laced with antihistamine so that Rachel would get drowsy. Then Caroline asked Rachel to close her eyes and meditate, presenting it as part of the psychological study and instructed her to, quote, focus on happy and pleasant things. While Rachel's eyes were closed, Caroline wrapped a telephone cord around her neck and then strangled her to death. Once she had killed Rachel, she put her body in her wardrobe and just left her there. Rachel's body was in her apartment for two days. And then on March 3rd, she wrapped her body into rugs and into blankets. And then that's when she had the body transported to her father's farm in Kilmore. Again, she told the drivers that she was simply moving a statue. Once she brought Rachel's body to the farm, Caroline buried her beside her cat who was buried years earlier. It's just truly shocking that she planned all of this and killed this 15 
13-year-old girl, someone that she knew and that she had babysat when she was younger. And, you know, Rachel trusted her and she must have been just so confused in the moment as to why Caroline was doing this to her. On Saturday, March 13th, police searched the Kilmore farm and they found a cross that was marked Lucy, which was the cat's name. And sure enough, right by that grave in a disturbed part of the earth, that's where Rachel's body had been buried. She was wrapped in two blankets and she still had the black electrical wire from the phone cord wrapped around her neck. An autopsy was done, which revealed ligature strangulation as a probable cause of death, consistent with the cable found around Rachel's neck. So police had looked through Caroline's notebook and they actually found out that she had journals going back to her childhood. The notebooks were full of pages with scribbles on them and some of the pages had even been ripped out. One of her journals even had the saying, quote, how to change in nine weeks written on the front. Now from the journal entries, it showed that Caroline had severe depression and she was diagnosed with epilepsy at 16. Her father had moved out and remarried when she was in her teens. And you know, like I mentioned, that just destroyed Caroline's relationship with her mother. She had written her parents many letters in these journals and in some just loose letters talking about her very poor mental health. She wrote things like, everything is much more worse than before. I don't know how I've survived this long. I have nothing whatsoever to look forward to in life, no reason to live, only more and more reasons to end my horrible existence arise each day. I'm embarrassed to live. And that specific note was addressed to her father. Now these were all cries for help and Rachel's mother, Elizabeth, remembered that Caroline's mother, Gail, would often come across the street to their house and she would vent to Elizabeth about what her daughter was going through. She would tell Elizabeth that she just didn't know what to do about Caroline and about her depression. And Elizabeth told her, you know, why don't you go have her see someone, you know, go to therapy. And Gail said that they had already tried that, but it didn't work. Looking back at this, Elizabeth just can't believe that she was comforting the mother of her daughter's killer. Of course, you know, the mom isn't the one that killed Rachel, but still, Elizabeth feels like the parents of Caroline, you know, should have done more to help her. Caroline had extreme self-image issues and thought that she was an ugly misfit who had, quote, pizza face with brown oily hair and no coordination. Caroline had drawn a completely black self-portrait of herself. In the drawings and in her writing, she just thought so horrible of herself and she used horrible words like obese, deformed, ugly, worthless, and just so many other mean words to describe herself. And I do just want to point out that Caroline actually didn't look like the things that she was calling herself. You know, maybe she wasn't like stick skinny, but she was not fat and she was not ugly. Like when I first saw a photo of her, I was expecting to see something totally different than what I did see. Caroline was really just a normal looking girl with nothing physically wrong with her. Going back to the notebook, she wrote about how much she hated herself and how she hated going to school because kids called her names and bullied her mainly for her weight. From her writing, it doesn't seem like she had any friends. However, when detectives spoke to her coworkers and to her boss, the boss said that Caroline would often talk about these friends that she had that were involved in theater and in television. Now, the boss says that he was surprised by this because Caroline just didn't strike him as being interested in, you know, the arts but she always talked about these friends. Now, she didn't actually have friends, so a lot of people suspect that she was talking about Rachel while saying this, and you know, in her mind, she genuinely thought that they were still close friends. She also had created an I Hate Caroline group, which she was a president of. She also wrote about her fears that she would be a failure at achieving her dream of acting, and how she hated her life and her appearance, even saying that, quote, I feel like a troubled and tortured lost soul thrown into the world of angels. It just seemed like she really did not like herself and she thought so little of herself. She just didn't feel like she was beautiful or worth it. But she did think that Rachel was. She had actually written about Rachel in her notebooks a handful of times. Caroline called the Barber House between 1998 and 1999 to get the birthdays of all three girls. Now she told them that it was for a project, but it was actually so that she could create this like timeline of their lives in her journals that detailed what the Barber household was like or what it was like in Caroline's mind. And you know, this is when investigators could see that Caroline had an obsession with Rachel. Caroline saw Rachel as this perfect, 
beautiful girl who had everything and she would constantly compare herself to her. To Caroline, Rachel had everything that she wanted. You know, she had beauty, she had a dancer's body, she was popular, she had a boyfriend, she had talent, she went to this prestigious dance school. So Caroline just used completely different words to describe Rachel than she did to herself. She always said that Rachel was always wild and that she was let to go run barefoot in the country. She began dating very young and that she was a very talented classical ballet dancer. She continued to write that Rachel had tried modeling, that she was strikingly attractive, and that she had a dancer's body, had clear, pale skin, hypnotic green eyes, and that she had dyed her hair lots of different colors. So again, she just obviously saw Rachel in such a better light than she saw herself. Her journals also showed that she had plans to change her name to Jem Saffel, which was actually Rachel's mom, Elizabeth's maiden name. And she had also written a new personality for herself. Along with all of this, in her journals, she had also planned out Rachel's murder. In her journals, she wrote about her plan. She put, quote, on the way to dance school, Rachel will say that she can't tell anyone that she's meeting me as I'm not allowed to give the study results to anyone. Ethics, highly confidential not even your boyfriend slash parents. She said she was going to, quote, drug Rachel, toxic over mouth, put her body into army bags and disfigure and dump somewhere way out, no car. She also wrote, quote, meet in toilet block, no cameras, people come into the city, get birth certificate, rent a box so Rachel can't be traced, check farm, including bag, Tuesday, arrange bank loan, moving van, night to disguise hair, thoroughly clean house, and steam clean carpet. It's just shocking. I can't believe she wrote all of that down, and I don't really know why Caroline wanted Rachel's birth certificate so badly. You know, like, what is that about? Some people speculate that Caroline just wanted to take over Rachel's identity. You know, she wanted the birth certificate because she truly believed that she was Rachel, which I don't understand how she thought she would get away with this. Like, she can't just, like, take Rachel's identity, like, take over her life, her dance classes, her family, everything. All of this was just incredibly shocking. The obsession that she had with this 15-year-old girl and the way that she planned out her murder in such detail is horrifying. She knew that Rachel trusted her and she was going to use that to her advantage and it's just absolutely heartbreaking. After listening to Caroline's confession and going through all of her notebooks and all of this evidence on March 13th, police tried to interrogate Caroline again in a formal interview in the police station because the last conversation was at the hospital. But now Caroline was saying that she didn't really know much about the case and that she couldn't really remember what had happened. So it seems like she was trying to take back her confession, but that didn't really work. And Caroline was officially charged with the murder of Rachel Barber on March 13th. And what's so crazy is that the police really believed that Rachel had just run away. Like, if her family hadn't done everything they did and put up the posters, Caroline might have gotten away with it, which is just so upsetting. On March 15th, Caroline had her first court appearance. She didn't enter a plea or ask for bail. Her attorney said that Caroline and Rachel had pizza, and that's all that she remembers. She did say that she admitted to disposing of Rachel's body, but said that two men helped her. In January of 2000, Caroline had a committal hearing and it was determined that the murder was premeditated. At this time, she pleaded not guilty. In October of 2000, Caroline ended up switching her plea deal and she pleaded guilty to the murder of Rachel. During the court appearance, Caroline described herself as unhappy and friendless, as a nobody, and said that she wanted to be somebody else somebody better. She had become obsessed with Rachel because she felt as though she was the embodiment of pure and everything that she wished to be. During the court hearing, forensic psychiatrist Justine Barry Walsh said that Caroline was profoundly disturbed when she murdered Rachel, but that she was not legally insane. She said, quote, it is possible that she thought she could somehow reinvent herself in the image of the victim. She explained that by trying to magically reinvent herself in Rachel's image, Caroline could have believed that she would become as successful and loved as Rachel had been. During this time, Caroline was also diagnosed with a personality disorder. The judge in this case, Judge Vincent, said that Caroline was a real danger to anyone who may become the unfortunate subject of her fixation. On November 29th, 2000, Caroline came to court for her sentencing looking very different. Her wavy brown hair was now straight, 
and blonde. Despite Judge Vincent's acknowledgement of Caroline's self-hatred and mental problems, and you know, he recognized that people would maybe feel sorry for her, but he said that no one's life is perfect, and he couldn't ignore the level of premeditation in this case. The judge said that Caroline's actions were motivated by envy of Rachel for her family, her beauty, and her personality. And because she believed that Rachel would likely have a happy and successful life, the type, again, that Caroline anticipated she would never experience herself. So in the end, Caroline was sentenced to 20 years in prison with a minimum term of 14 and a half years, meaning that she wouldn't be eligible for parole until after that. She was actually eligible for parole on August 10th, 2013, but this was delayed because Rachel's family was just so upset about this. They wanted her to stay behind bars for at least 18 years. So her parole was delayed until further notice. I mean, of course the family was upset about this. You know, they said that Caroline was such a good actress and that she could manipulate people into thinking that she was, you know, okay and that she had been rehabilitated when in reality, she wasn't. You know, they were nervous that when she got out of prison, she could come looking for them or maybe she would come looking for Rachel's sisters. It was a really scary situation for them and they just wanted the court to confirm that Caroline was rehabilitated and that she wasn't going to harm anyone again. But in October of 2014, Caroline's application for parole was approved. Other inmates said that she shouldn't be paroled because she actually never showed any remorse for what she did. Elizabeth also spoke out saying that she was afraid that Caroline would do it again. As for Manny, Rachel's boyfriend, he said that he would have panic attacks at the thought of Caroline being released. She was eventually released on January 21st, 2015, so she served 14 years of her 20-year sentence. She walked out of the prison wearing a black baseball cap and she was picked up by two of her friends. Now, about the situation, Elizabeth said, quote, she won't be any less on my mind and she won't be any more. She said, that she has forgiven Caroline, you know, it's taken her time to do this, but she's forgiven her because if she continued to hate her, she would just always be feeling angry and bitter. And she just said that it's not fair for her to act that way for her other children. She said that she was aware that Caroline would be living on the opposite side of Victoria, you know, away from her family, but did not believe that she was a threat to them. She said, quote, I don't think she is dangerous to us, but I don't want her to be dangerous to anybody. Elizabeth said that she does not want Caroline to reoffend and that she should be, quote, thankful she lives in a nation where she could resume her life outside of prison. She said, Mike, my husband, is really firm that he does not want her harassed. My mother once said to me she hoped Caroline would put something back into the community. I don't know what kind of work she could do. She is an intelligent woman, not intelligent in that she plotted and murdered our daughter, but in terms of her IQ. Now, the Barbers say that Caroline has never apologized to them for what she did to Rachel and that they actually don't want her to reach out to them or speak to them or have any type of relation with each other. Elizabeth said, nobody wants their daughter murdered and justice, as far as Rachel is concerned, will never be done because Rachel's life has been taken away from her. As for what Caroline was up to while she was in jail, she continued to drastically change her appearance to look more more like Rachel. She came out looking leaner, with straight hair, and with a clear complexion. Elizabeth noted that there was a Rachel likeness in her eyes. She said, I kept thinking she looks like someone I know. I thought, bloody hell, it has that feel about Rachel. At first glance, it's kind of weird. Everything is different, but she still has that look. She doesn't look anything like Caroline. I wouldn't have recognized her in the least. She's totally different. Caroline was in her mid thirties when she got released and she had been in a long-term relationship with an armed robber she met in prison named Annette Chubbs Taylor. They stayed together when Caroline got out and they were planning to live together upon Annette's release in 2015. So because of this, some people have speculated that maybe Caroline also had a romantic obsession with Rachel and may have wanted, you know, a relationship with her, but that's just a theory. You know, Caroline did write a lot in her notebooks, but she never wrote anything romantic about Rachel. Elizabeth ended up writing a book about what happened to Rachel, and in 2009, the book was adapted into a movie called In Her Skin, directed by Simon North and starring Guy Pearce and Sam Neill. 
The family was involved in every step of the process. You know, they helped with the script. They met with the crew and the cast. They even sat down with Kate Bell, who was cast as a role of Rachel. The family says that this was very emotional because obviously the actress had to look similar to Rachel and it was just a lot for the family to take in. They decided to do the movie because they felt like they were giving Rachel a voice beyond the grave. And this is kind of just like a side note, but in 2021 on the Lauren Phillips radio show, she joked about listening to a podcast about Rachel Barber's death. She said that that day she got into an argument with her partner, so she left the house and she decided to just put on a podcast to distract herself. Well, it was a true crime podcast talking about what happened to Rachel. And Lauren was laughing while talking about this and just joking around being like, oh, I guess this is what I listen to when I'm upset. And I just don't think that you should ever laugh when hearing details about someone's terrible death. It's just like extremely inappropriate. And of course, the public was upset about this as well because she was laughing about such a serious topic. And this really upset Manny, you know, Rachel's then boyfriend, who went on to become famous pop singer Emmanuel Carella. Now, Manny took to Facebook saying that he was freaking angry about the insensitive segment. He said, quote, this is not OK. How on earth would you think this is funny? This was Rachel's life, a 15 year old girl who was brutally murdered, who didn't deserve to die. You've lost my support amongst everyone who knew my girlfriend, Rachel absolutely disgusting. Once Lauren saw how the public reacted to this, she actually reached out to the Barber family and apologized for her insensitive comments. She admitted that she didn't know that she was talking about a real person and that she thought Rachel's story was fiction, which is interesting because she was listening to a true crime podcast. I'm not sure how she thought that this was a fictional story, but it's just really sad. I can't imagine how Rachel's family felt when they saw her just laughing and joking about listening to the details of Rachel's terrible death. What happened to Rachel is an absolute tragedy. She was only 15 years old and she did not deserve this. As Elizabeth mentioned, Rachel would only go out with people that she fully trusted. So the fact that she was willing to meet with Caroline, her old babysitter, and kept this a secret from her family meant that she really did trust Caroline. And Caroline absolutely betrayed her trust and did such a terrible thing to her and it just breaks my heart. When Rachel's sister Heather found out that Caroline was the one who had killed Rachel, she said that she was shocked but also not shocked at the same time. It was shocking because this was her old babysitter, but looking back at it, she says that she always felt like something was off about Caroline. She was just really weird and she had a very odd behavior, so she just wasn't surprised to learn that Caroline was obsessed with Rachel and had done this terrible thing. Elizabeth says that it breaks her heart to think about what her daughter had to go through in her final moments. I mean, one minute Rachel is having pizza with her old babysitter. And then the next minute, her old babysitter is strangling her. Elizabeth says that Rachel must have been so confused as to why this happened. And there really is just no logical reason as to why Caroline did this. And it's just so senseless. My thoughts and prayers go out to Rachel's family. I am so sorry that this happened to your loved one. She was absolutely beautiful and she deserved so much more. It really is scary that Rachel was manipulated by Caroline to keep this a secret from her family and even from her boyfriend. If there are parents listening to this case, I think it's so important to talk to your children about this type of situation. And you know, if someone is telling you to keep something a secret from your parents, from your boyfriend and from your friends, from everyone, that should definitely raise red flags especially if it involves you meeting this person late at night and, you know, getting money from them, you know, things like that. So I just think it's always important to communicate this with at least just like one person, even if it's like with your friend, just tell them where you're going and who you're meeting and what you're doing. This is just a really heartbreaking case and it's scary to know that Caroline is out there somewhere. Hopefully she does leave the Barber family alone and the Barber family continues to heal from this and just live their life. But all right, you guys, that's pretty much all the information I have for today's video. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to what happened to Rachel Barber. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to leave me a comment down below so I can see your thoughts on this case. And if there's ever any other cases you would like me to cover, also leave me a comment under my YouTube video or send me a message on Instagram. Don't forget to follow, raise, and review what happened wherever you get your podcast and subscribe to my channel true crime jackie on youtube for full video episodes you can find me on instagram at the jackie flores and on tiktok at true crime jackie bye guys